and welcome to Crime Divers. I'm Laura. And I'm Jill. And welcome to today's episode. Hello, everybody. So, Jill, where in the world are we today? We're in the USA. Okie dokie. And the title? Poison and Lies. Ooh. Interesting. Hmm. This, uh, this actually is quite interesting. All right. Shall we dive in? Yes, let's dive in. So, today we are going to talk about Audrey Marie Hilly. Okay. So, she was born Audrey Marie Fraser on the 4th of June 1933 and was most often called Marie. So that's what I'm going to refer to yeah, her as in this episode. Okay. So she lived in the Blue Mountain neighbourhood of Anniston, Alabama, with her parents Huey and Lucille until she married her husband, Frank Hilly, on the 8th of May 1951. And they had two children together, Mike and Carol. So on the 26th of February 1987... Marie was found muddy and incoherent outside of a house in Aniston. So the woman who found her said that Marie looked scary, like her her hair and her clothes were wet. Mm. She was dirty with like mud on her face and under her long fingernails. So she, this the woman obviously that found her, called the police and they contacted the paramedics. So police officer Gary Carroll called her name. Um, because he knew he knew who she was, uh-huh. and she opened her eyes, looked at him, and then her eyes just rolled back, and she passed out. Right. So she was rushed to the hospital, and there she had a heart attack, and the the doctors tried to revive her, but she was pronounced dead three and a half hours, um, after she was found. Oh dear. So the coroner believed that she had been crawling around in the woods, soaking wet from days of rain and exposed to temperatures that had dropped. To around freezing, so her cause of death was hypothermia and exposure. Mm-hmm. So you probably think that she's the victim in this case. Uh, yeah, I was, I was thinking that. She's not. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. She is not the victim in this case. Oh, okay, right. So we're going to rewind back uh-huh. to when Marie and Frank, um, after they got married. So Frank had been in the Navy, but when Marie fell pregnant with Mike... Frank retired and he started working in the shipping department of a, of a foundry. So Marie worked as an executive secretary, but she wanted to be rich. She wanted to be a socialite. She saw that world um, because she was working for like rich executives. So she saw that world. She wanted that. Yeah, she wanted a piece of that. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Um, she was working in circles um, of some of the city's most prominent businessmen. She, so she liked to look the part, like she would have nice clothes, always had her makeup on, like her, her hair was perfect. But by the time her, um, her children, Mike and Carol, were teenagers, the cost of Marie's expensive tastes for high-end clothes and cars had put a financial strain on the family. Right. So they were a close family and they were churchgoers. They would regularly attend friends and neighbours, like barbecues, and sometimes, sometimes they would just stay in, watch TV together, eating donuts. But eventually, Mike and Carol began hearing their parents argue quite often, which I'm assuming was probably to do with the financial strain. Yeah, yeah. Um, but one day, well, not just that, because one day in 1975, Frank told his son, Mike, who was now an ordained minister, that um, that Marie was having an affair. So he had came home early from work one day mm-hmm. and caught Marie in bed with her boss. Oh dear. And apparently she would sleep with him in exchange for money or to get really good work evaluations. Oh, okay. So, well, that's a way of getting a good work evaluation. Well, I totally. <laughs> um, and I think that he wasn't the only one that she was mm-hmm. um, doing that with. Probably more than one. <laughs> so, Frank began to suffer from stomach pains and nausea. And this went on for a few months, but his doctor couldn't pinpoint what was wrong with him. Okay. So, in the second week of May 1975... Frank's health took a dramatic turn. He was in a lot of pain, he was having bad diarrhoea, um, but he was also disorientated. So Marie phoned Mike, their son, in a panic and told him that Frank had been admitted to hospital. So tests indicated a malfunction of the liver and on Sunday the 25th of May, 45-year-old Frank died. So the cause of death was recorded as, recorded as infectious hepatitis. So his autopsy revealed swelling of the kidneys and lungs, bilateral pneumonia and inflammation of the stomach. And these symptoms closely resembled those of hepatitis, mm-hmm. so no further tests were carried out. They are like, yep, that's it. That's what it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
So Frank did have life insurance, although he didn't know about it. <laughs> so <laughs> Marie had t- uh, secretly taken it out when he first started to feel ill. Funny that. Mm-hmm. And she got their mortgage paid off. Right. And $31,140, which in today's money would be $178,078. So quite a lot of money, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's get, and she'd also had her mortgage paid off, so she didn't have his yeah. house is paid. Uh-huh. I've got $178,000 to play with. Yeah. That's a lot of money. That's So the police officer, Gary Carroll, who was later to be the last person to see Marie before she died, um, said that by 1977, he had become a fam- he had become familiar with the name Marie Hilly as she was a as she was a regular called. She... <laughs> what are you as she was a regular, I think. Oh, she was a regular caller to Aniston Police Station. Right. I said called instead of caller. Yeah, I've got caller. myself confused. Caller. Yeah, so that's how I said that Gary who. Later, when he found yeah. her, he knew who she who was. She was yeah. Um, because she would, she was always phoning. She'd be reporting a burglary or threatening notes, threatening phone calls, vandalism, and arson. Right. I have no idea why. I still don't know why. Even though I've yeah. researched this case, I'm no I'm attention seeking. I have no yeah, idea. Maybe. maybe she fancied the police officer. Who knows? Maybe. Um, but when police traced one of the threatening phone calls, it, it came from her office phone to her house phone. Oh, <laughs> so, well, of course, bit, uh, so of course the officer was like, well, she's bullshitting about that, so it should bullshit about, about everything else. Yeah, what else is she talking about? Yeah, <laughs> so I had to care, I have no idea. So Marie, Marie's neighbour, who was also a widow with two children, had reported similar events, but more disturbingly, her sons were complaining of persistent stomach pains since moving in. Oh, right. um, as soon as they moved away, their problems cleared up. So as we're going to find out, Marie was a poisoner. Yes. Um, so it's thought that she was testing how much poison she could give to a person on those boys. <gasps> That's so, terrible. you know, they were neighbours. Like, you know, she was obviously like giving them drinks and or food or whatever, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. being a friendly neighbour. Uh-huh. And she was obviously testing how much she could get away with. That's bad. So four years after Frank's death, Marie had spent all the life insurance. <laughs> Hey, money, yeah, and had fallen behind with loan repayments. So her son Mike, who was now married and living in Florida, he was receiving demanding letters from credit companies. So he was like, "What the hell? Why am I getting demanding letters for money?" Mm-hmm. So he went to visit Marie to find out what was going on. So I'm assuming she must have him as sort of next of kin, or or, or she's taking out credit cards in his name. Yeah. Anyway, he was getting demanding letters for her debt anyway. Yeah. Whatever the case was. Yeah. Um, so as he ate breakfast there, he got sick. He was throwing up and had stomach pains. And, you know, funnily enough, again, the symptoms went away after he left. Yeah, they fucking eat house, eh? But it's thought that Marie had poisoned him, but he never got tested. So that's just what's thought right, yeah. to be to have happened. Yeah. Just, I mean, he might have coincidentally just got ill while yeah. he was visiting his mum. But yeah, really after, so. you know, whatever... What we know. Yeah. Um, that's probably what happened. So so I'm assuming with him being so sick, like while he was there, he probably didn't get to the bottom of what was going on. He was probably like, right, I want to go home. And yeah. I don't know what happened with that. So in 1978, Marie took out another life insurance policy, this time on herself and her daughter, Carol. So Carol was now 19 and started a course at Jacksonville State University. And she decided to rent a, a, a place of her own. So Marie took her shopping for furniture and she paid for it all with a cheque. But unfortunately, the cheque bounced, so she must have been skint. Mm -hmm. So in April 1979, Carol, the daughter, Mm -hmm. started getting bouts of nausea and throwing up. Mm -hmm. She was admitted to hospital several times and her condition just got worse. So a doctor said, quote, we're talking about severe muscle spasms, season of the muscles, particularly in the abdominal wall, gastrointestinal pain she might have had contractions in her arms sight becomes blurred tremendous headaches not being able to feel for instance she had a numbness throughout her body and this unquenchable thirst this is a huge receipt for just a torturous torturous death Mm. end quote um, so when Marie went to visit Carol in hospital she took some baby food with her Mm -hmm. and an injection that she said would stop the nausea. So she was kept giving her these injections, but Carol just get, kept 
I'm sorry, kept getting sicker and sicker. Uh -huh. She didn't tell anyone about the injections because her mum told her to keep uh, keep it a secret. But she had told Carol that the doctors were. So she was going to the hospital and giving her these injections. Yeah, and she told Carol that the doctors have said it was okay. Like here, go and give that to your I daughter. Wasn't. Administer that injection. Yeah, because she's like, that's what I was in the hospital. You're family or parents like yeah give you your medication <laughs> i'm assuming that carol must have just been so sick that she was just you know she probably wasn't able to think properly and you know okay. um so one day one of the relatives walked into carol's room and saw marie with a sy syringe in her hand and when asked what she was doing she said that the doctors had told her to give carol some injections mm -hmm. um what <laughs> I don't know. Was that a thing back then? I don't think so. Well, I don't think so. We're, this, I mean, it was the seventies, but I, I still don't think that's ever been a thing, has it? No, not unless. Oh, I'm too busy. So here, Mrs. Hilly, here's an injection. Go and give that to your daughter. You know what to do. You just find a vein, stick uh, it in. Exactly. Yeah. No, yeah. Be funny no. The, only, the only time that that that's going to be the case is like nowadays when you have medication from home that you're sent home with that you can do for like diabetes, diabetes and or, things yeah you know if you go to IVF you have to do injections yeah. and stuff like that I mean that kind of thing that that's that is the thing now but you would do that at home if you go to a hospital you have a, there a doctor doctors or a there that will do it for you yes <laughs> they think just, that's the way it's supposed to work yeah it's like it's like going to a dentist or something saying oh you oh you need a fill-in today oh do you want to do it yourself <laughs> hi all right then <laughs> hi Pat you're, you're mum in the waiting room we'll just get her to do it for you I know, you're just... Yeah. Uh, anyway, after a medical test couldn't find what was wrong, Carol's doctor thought the symptoms could have been psychosomatic. So I googled, because I was like, well, I kind of had a clue by the psycho bit, mm -hmm. but I was like, okay, I'm going to Google this and see what, because Laura will be like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And this is defined by one or more chronic physical symptoms that coincide with excessive and maladaptive thoughts, emotions and behaviours connected to those symptoms. So basically the doctors were saying it's all in your head. So you've got these symptoms, but you're kind of like mm. manifesting them in your head yeah. or something like that. Uh -huh. So they actually transferred her to the Carraway Methodist Hospital, 40 miles away in Birmingham, for psychiatric testing. Oh, right. So a month after Carol was admitted, mm -hmm. her doctor reported that she was suffering from mal malnutrition and vitamin deficiencies and he suspected that heavy metal poisoning was to blame right. so marie heard this and panicked and she just discharged carol from the hospital that day uh-huh but the following day carol was obviously so sick that she was admitted to an, uh, um, the university of alabama hospital so the doctors concentrated their investigation on the possibility of heavy metal poisoning noting that carol's hands and feet were numb so a doctor noticed carol's fingernails um, and the same doctor that I quoted earlier said, quote, first off, when you observe the fingernails and in individuals that have been exposed to arsenic, particularly over a long period of time, there's these little lines that create on the surface of the nails. So right. it's like lines just, uh, sort of white lines just oh. going across the nails. Yeah. I saw a picture. <laughs> so this does not happen under any other circumstances. So at that point in time, the doctor knew that something was up, that more than likely she had been exposed to arsenic. End quote. So tests at University Hospital confirmed that Cara was indeed suffering from arsenic poisoning. The tests were carried out on samples of her hair and her levels were ranging from over 100 times the normal level close to the scalp right. to zero times the normal level at the end of the hair shaft. So this indicated that Carol had been given increasingly larger doses of arsenic over a period of four to eight months. So I'm assuming they must have been able to tell by the hair growth. Right, okay. Um, so over a period of four to eight months. And this was essentially infused into her cells and organs, so her organs slowly began to shut down. Mm -hmm. So on the 19th of September, 1979, Marie was arrested, but not for that. She was arrested, she wasn't arrested for trying to kill her daughter. Oh. She was arrested for check fraud. Right. So she had been writing checks to the insurance company that insured Carol's life, but because the checks bounced, that policy was made void. Uh-huh. So, Which you think is a bit dumb, considering <laughs> she probably wants the life insurance but, money, doesn't she? Well, yes, this is obviously what she's trying so to do. you think she would make sure that she paid it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. This woman's a bit of cray, -cray banana, I think. Mm -hmm. So... I think when she was arrested, they hadn't quite figured out what was going on with Carol yet. 
Um, but I think the test results confirmed the poisoning like during Marie's arrest. So she was already mm -hmm. um, in custody. She was already at the police right. station. So when they realised that Carol had been poisoned, her dad's Frank's body was exhumed, Marie's husband. Mm -hmm. And tests were carried out on his body and they found between 10 to 100 times the normal level of arsenic. Mm -hmm. So on the 9th of October, while she was still in custody on the fraud charges, Marie was arrested for the attempted murder of her daughter, Carol. Yeah, and not the murder of her husband. Well, no, just stop jumping the gun. Okay, okay. So police found a vial in her purse, tests of which revealed the presence of arsenic. Mm -hmm. uh, two weeks later... No, two weeks later, Frank's sister... Frank's sister must have been... I'm not quite sure what happened with Frank's sister. She must, <laughs> she must have been... Maybe they weren't quite suspecting Cat, eh, Marie yet or something. She was suspicious of Marie, so she thought she'd go to the house and have a wee snoop about. Right. So she, um, she found a jar of rat poison in Marie's house, which contained 1.4 to 1.5% arsenic. So on the 9th of November, Marie was leaf released on bail... One of her rich men friends that she had previously worked for as a secretary posted a cash bond for her. So that's how she got out, because I'm sure the bail must have been really high. Mm, I would have thought so. Um, personally, I don't think she should have been allowed out on bail. No, but, me neither. And you'll find out why, because Marie checked in at a local motel under a, an assumed name, but when her attorney went to meet her, she was gone. Oh, right, so, so she fled. Probably shouldn't have been let on no, bail. Flight risk. So a note had been left indicating that Marie had been kidnapped mm. and her attorney was not to try and find her. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's so unbelievable. Uh, on the 19th of November, another note in similar handwriting appeared at her ha aunt's house, which had been burgled. Her car had been taken, as well as some clothes and an overnight bag. So I wonder who burgled oh, her. I wonder, I wonder. The note, the note said, do not call police, we will burn you out if you do. We found what we wanted and we'll not bother you again. And funnily enough, the handwriting on these notes matched Marie's. <laughs> She's not very good, is she? <laughs> so she was now on the run, crossing state borders, abandoning her daughter, her debts and, of course, the law. Uh -huh. So a couple of months after she left, she was indicted with ab absentia, which is a legal term for a while absent for first-degree murder, as by then they had figured out that she had murdered her husband, Frank. Yeah. So a nationwide manhunt began, but for years, Marie was nowhere to be found. Oh, she did well in that count then, I suppose. Mm -hmm. No, she wasn't that thick after all. Maybe not. So further investigations found that Marie's mum and also her mother-in-law had significant but not fatal traces of arsenic in their systems when they, when they had died. Mm -hmm. So she hadn't murdered them, but she must have been poisoned. She was poisoned them, but they just died of other causes, yeah. so it wasn't the arsenic that had killed them. But clearly but, she would have got to that point, no? Yeah, she was just must have just been feeding everybody. I think she was just, like, playing potluck or something, like, well, I'll just poison everybody mm -hmm. and see who dies. Yeah, and see if I can get some money out of it. Yeah, see if I can get... I, I think that's exactly what she it was. She just loved the high life, so she just wanted the money. Yeah. Um, so it also emerged that many of the neighbourhood children, like Mike, Mike and Carol's friends when they'd been younger, had fallen ill after visiting Marie's house. You know, because obviously people are sort of putting two and two together once they've realised mm -hmm. that she was a poison. I'm thinking, ah, my son or my daughter mm -hmm. used to go play around yeah. that there. And I can remember a few times they weren't feeling very well when they came home. You know, so they've obviously put That's two and why. two together. Mm -hmm. um, and two police officers who had been dispatched to a domestic disturbance at the house also reported coming down with stomach cramps and nausea after drinking coffee there. Mm -hmm. So basically she'd just been poisoning yeah, anyone everybody. and everyone for years. Yeah. But, I mean... To what end, really? Well, I mean, I, I can understand, like, the, the husband, because of the life insurance, the money, obviously. Yeah. I guess the daughter, because of the life insurance as well. But the the random people, like... Well, exactly. What's she going to get out of that? Or does she just enjoy doing it? Maybe she must she, have. She must have got some, something out of it. Maybe she just thought, oh, well, may as well. Because, unless she didn't know how much would kill somebody, mm. so yeah. she she was just testing to see how much would kill someone yeah, maybe. so these people she was murdered oh, right i'll stick some in this guy's coffee see what happens to him mm -hmm. give this child some see what happens to them and obviously but luckily it hasn't been enough to kill them i think but if it had been enough to kill them it should be like oh right okay well i know how much to give my husband yeah, i would like like most things and like like i mean i know there's some cases where something you take can instantly kill you but 
a lot of poisoning cases tend to be over a period of time. Yeah. So you think that she would... But then maybe she didn't know that. Maybe. I mean, if you think about back in those days, you didn't have the internet and, yeah, you know, true. you can research readily. Yeah, Aye, true. Um, like, what amount of... Yeah, uh, I mean, now we can just Google, right, how much arsenic... Will it take to kill will somebody? Will it take to kill somebody? Well, yeah, I, was... I hope that the police didn't look at your... Your computer uh, records, like, but uh, I don't really think that, that that's something you should be allowed to Google right enough. But but that's the kind of thing I might Google though, because if I'm researching a case, that's relevant. I mean, there has but been we, at least if you were ever questioned, you could say we have the evidence. We have the evidence to show that we do a true crime podcast. Yeah, so we're not intending on poisoning anybody in any shape <laughs> yeah. or form. I was just wondering how much it would take to kill somebody for yeah, the case. Exactly. Because I have done that. I mean, there was one where I think it was the um the Philpot. Family, remember the the McPhil potty um set his house on oh, fire yeah. and killed all the children. Uh-huh. Um, well, him and his wife, Marie, 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 Marie something like that. Um, and I remember googling something about how hot does a fire have to be, or something like you know something along those lines. Yeah. And I'm thinking, why did the police looked at my searches? Like, hey, what are you planning to do? <laughs> but yeah, we do have the evidence. Exactly. So. We're just we're just we're just researching for our cases. Yeah, we? but as I said, like back then, you wouldn't necessarily be able to find out as readily how yeah, that's much. True. So yeah. you just so obviously she just thought, well, I'd try it out. I'll, yeah, internet hasn't been invented yet, so I will just test yeah. out on the neighbourhood children and the police yeah, and yeah, whoever true. else comes into co- I come into contact with. Yeah, right then. So. Marie um, remained a fugitive for just over three years. She did well then. Yeah, <laughs> she did all right. And in that time, she had travelled to Florida under the name Robbie Hannon, and she met a guy called John Greenleaf Homan the third. So he sounds rich. Oh. Um, you know, just her type, obviously. Obviously. So they lived together for about a year, and then they got married on the 29th of May 1981, and she took his surname. So she was now Robbie Homan. So the couple moved to New Hampshire and they lived there for a while. Um, and she told, but then she told John and her new work colleagues and friends, because she obviously, you know, settled down, got a job, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Um, and she had new friends. Like she, basically, she told everybody that she had a rare internal blood disorder. Right. And she also had a twin sister in Dallas called Terry Martin. Right. So late in the summer of 1982, she told John that she had to go to Texas to, to take... Care of her si- of her sick twin sister. So her, si- her twin sister was sick, mm-hmm. so she had to go and take care of her. Mm-hmm. So off she went, and while she was there, she changed her appearance. She lost weight, changed her hair color, and after a little while, she called John and told her that she was the twin sister Terry, and that Marie slash Robbie had gotten sick while she was there and died. Right. So basically, right. <laughs> do you, I need to explain some well better just just in case anybody's confused. So Marie was Robbie has a twin sister called Terry. So Terry, no, I can't confuse myself. So now she's Terry. Right, yeah. Marie is now Terry. Yeah. And Marie has Marie slash Robbie. Well, Mar- Robbie because her husband and her friends know Robbie. Yes. So Robbie's dead. Yes. And she's now Terry. Right. <laughs> okay. So now she was. So now she was Terry Martin, Marie's fictional twin sister, or Robbie's fictional twin yeah. sister, not Marie's. Uh-huh. See, getting myself confused. Yeah. So she told John, Robbie's wife, so that John would be her brother-in-law. Yeah. So she told him that she had donated his wife's body to medical science, so he didn't need to claim the body. Oh, it's all right. You don't need to do anything about it. I've donated what? it to medical science. So they didn't even have like a funeral. Yeah, but nobody got invited. I'm, I'm just about to tell you that. For fuck's sake. So, a few months later, she turned up on John's doorstep as Terry. So she's like, yeah, hell, I'm, I'm the twin sister. Mm-hmm. So John believed that she was Robbie's twin and took her in. But some of his work colleagues weren't so sure and they, they actually alerted authorities. I don't know. <coughs> I don't know if they maybe suspected, as I said, I think he was maybe rich and... Or maybe they could just tell it was fucking her because right. maybe she had like certain certain traits and characteristics that were. Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, if they were identical and she's changed her hair and lost weight and stuff, she could look a bit different. So, mm. but they're obviously suspicious anyway. Yeah. So they are set. They alerted, and probably just with the situation as well, the fact that there hadn't been a body and yeah, you know, oh, like his wife had just went to visit her twin sister and then died and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. So. 
Uh, it does sound a bit suspicious, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So they alerted authorities who investigated and they found that the place that Terry claimed she had donated Robbie's body to didn't exist. Right. And neither did the church that Terry claimed had a service for her. Right. So she just made up names of a medical science mm -hmm. place and yeah. a church. Mm -hmm. So John's work colleagues actually thought that Terry was some sort of con woman and was out to commit financial fraud or something like that at their workplace. And they are, so they had no idea who the hell this woman was. Um, so the authorities did investigate that and they actually thought that Terry was a pos was possibly a fugitive bank robber called Carol Mannon. So there was this fugitive oh, right, okay. bank robber and they're like, is, that, is this her? Is this her, yeah. Uh -huh. So, of course, they realised later that she wasn't. Mm -hmm. But, um, so also they, they thought that they were... Um, um, interrogating this Terry mm -hmm. so they, they didn't know that this was Marie so Marie actually admitted it herself so while she was being questioned she admitted that she was Audrey Marie Hilly there's right. a fly flying about in this room and it's really doing my head in <laughs> um, yeah so she so she said oh my name's Audrey Marie Hilly and I'm wanted in Alabama for check fraud right so of course once the police con contacted the authorities in Alabama they realised she was wanted for much more serious charges than, than And she fraud. also didn't realise that they had already decided that she had murdered her husband. Yeah, she mustn't have realised yeah. that. Like, oh, <laughs> very confusing. Yeah, it's very... But at least she's back to Marie now. Yes. <laughs> so that helps. She was trying to get out of getting in trouble for being... For, for, for being a, a bank robber. Yeah. She's getting out of that. that by she saying... was in trouble for check fraud, but actually <laughs> not realising that she was actually wanted for murder now. <laughs> it's all very confusing. Uh -huh. So on the 12th of January 1983, Marie was arrested and transferred back into the custody of Aniston Police. Mm -hmm. So her trial began on the 31st of May and John claimed that he had no idea that the woman he was living with was actually his dead wife. So they actually started up a relationship. So she... <laughs> She had posed as his, his dead wife's twin sister and actually started up oh, a relationship with him. That's just ridiculous. And he was shocked to hear about who she actually really was because she wasn't the twin sister. She wasn't Robbie. She was actually Marie. He must have been like, what the fuck? A poor man. I know, totally. Um, yeah, but, but he found out. Everyone, like, obviously, you know, he was informed of everything, who she was, what mm. she had done. And he stood by her. Oh, wow. And he supported her all the way through her trial. Wow. Like, what? Okay. So nearly the whole community attended the trial. And the trial judge, Samuel Monk, even had a hairdresser approach him and tell him that he had ruined her business because she didn't have any customers the week the trial started because they were all at the courthouse. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> and I'm like, really? You haven't had any customers for a week and that's your, that's your business ruined? Like, sure. Must have been doing very well. No, no. I mean, I it was not good for business, and you maybe no, lost of course not. a few bit of money, but I'm sure you you, you would be alright, wouldn't you? Just I'm sure they'll come back when they're been at the oh, you trial. Might be, you might be extra busy afterwards because they've all missed it in their weeks of anger. <laughs> no. <laughs> so extra security had to call down <laughs> to the trial because everybody was there, apart from this hairdresser. She was obviously sitting in her salon, a salon her, 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 her <laughs> and she's not getting anybody coming. She should, she should could have just done her haircuts at the courthouse. I know because there was like um, there were they, they actually had a line of people like mostly older females waiting to get in. So she could have just took a chair with her. Aye, like, here, love, I'll get your haircut. <laughs> Plunk your butt down here and I'll just get your hair cut here. Uh, Can I wash or dry it? But no. I'll get you a dry cut. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Marie and her, her attorney seemed confident that the case against her being circumstantial was weak. But Samuel Monk, the judge, had said, quote, everybody thinks you can't be convicted on circ circumstantial evidence, but that's not true. No, I. It's definitely not true. <laughs> but the circumstances have to be so overwhelming as to be convinced and be all, Convincing beyond reasonable doubt, and in this case, it was true. Uh -huh. So I I think they underestimated how much trial preparation would be, would be put in by the district attorney. I think they underestimated how much evidence Gary Carroll had been able to uncover and produce, end quote. So the state's key witnesses, uh, Marie's children, Mike and Carol, took the stand and testified against their mum. Mm -hmm. It's thought that Marie might have thought that Carol wouldn't have testified against her. <laughs> But in the three years that Marie had been on the run, Carol had gone from denial 
to the horrifying realization that her mum had murdered her dad and also tried it's to kill her. Yeah, yeah. You know, at first she was like, obviously, no, of course what? my mum wouldn't try yeah. to kill me. And of course she never killed my dad, but... Yeah, the realization. Yeah, so she was te- she did testify against her. Mm-hmm. And um, Marie never took the stand. Samuel Monk said that she could never have stood up to a cross-examination as her story would have never held together. No. He said that he could tell that as the trial went on, she was disappointed at how it was progressing. Uh-huh. And she probably knew by the end of the trial that she, she was, was going to be found guilty. Mm-hmm. And quite rightly so. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, she was found guilty. So Audrey Marie Hilly received a life sentence for the murder of her husband, Frank Hilly, and she was given 20 years for the attempted murder of her daughter, Carol. She was sent to the Julia... Tutwiler prison for women 90 miles away which is a maximum security prison mm-hmm. so because she had been a secretary before she was often given like jobs to do like office jobs to do mm-hmm. like paperwork and stuff and she was considered a quiet model prisoner mm-hmm. so because of her good behaviour she sometimes got a one day pass from prison mm-hmm. which she also returned from as scheduled uh, because she was such a good prisoner so less than four years in her sentence February 1987, she was granted a three-day furlough to visit her husband, John, because remember, he's still standing by her. So Judge Samuel Monk said, quote, furloughs used to be very common in the prison system. It's where you get a three-day pass and you have to come back, but they notify the local police that you've been released on furlough. That used to be very common when Alabama was more of an agricultural society. If there's any other way to put it, there was honour among thieves at that time. There is no honour among thieves now, end no. quote. So news of Marie's three-day furlough stunned everyone who knew about her or were involved with her case. They were amazed that she was allowed to leave, mm-hmm. which, yeah, she's yeah. a murderer. Exactly. Um, yeah. But apparently, even though Judge Monk said the authorities were always informed, they weren't this time. So oh. no one knew that she was out until she disappeared. So John and Marie had stayed at a motel in Aniston. John had left for a few hours, and when he got back, Marie had gone. She had left him a note begging for his forgiveness. Mm -hmm. John phoned the police, and naturally anyone involved with Marie's case was nervous. Mm -hmm. As she was a convicted murderer, and she was loose in the town where she had been convicted, people were scared in case she was going to do something to them. Like The police even phoned the judge and told him to get his wife to pick up his kids from school and take them home so they would be safe. Right. Because he said, quote, nobody knew how vengeful she might be. It would not have made any sense for her to try to be veg- vengeful towards us. But who knows? You, like, you don't know. I don't think she was insane, but she didn't have a rational mind for sure. I think sociopathic. She played people and sociopaths are normally that way. They're very friendly. They're very manipulative. They read you and use you to get their and they use you to their own advantage, end quote. So when 53-year-old Marie left the hotel, she headed off um, to her old Blue Mountain home mm-hmm. and four days later she died. So as I told you at the start of the episode, as, as, as I told you at the start of the episode, so it seems that she just picked the wrong week to make her escape. But, the weather was terrible, so there was lots of rain and low temperature mm-hmm. and she was on foot travelling for miles through mountainous terrain and she just didn't make it home. Oh, because I was thinking like if somebody poisoned her or something like that, but no, it was just the, the elements. Just, just yeah, oh, wow. she was obviously on foot trying to make it home. Right. And because of the bad weather, mm-hmm. she was exposed to the elements and she died. Oh, well, there you go. So, she, she got what she deserved, I suppose. <laughs> but, yeah. I know, but I still don't think she should have been... I, I, mean, I, I know it does happen that obviously when people get so far into sentences and depending on how high risk or low risk they, they get like days out of prison and day prisons and all that sort of stuff but I mean that was less than four years into her sentence yeah. and to me should, that's she should have to serve a lot more than that well I mean she got life mm-hmm. for Frank and 20 years for uh, Carol yeah so why is she getting let out like four years like at less than four freedom, years almost and before that she'd already had like Did days out know, as yeah. well so but as I said like yeah. You know, um, the judge has said like back then that yeah, um, the things. trust thing, and yeah. but why were the authorities not alerted that mm. she was out, yeah. and why, if they really had to let her out, why didn't they have like some sort of escort or something like that, some sort well, to of me, like if, if she or was a out, tag or something? Oh yeah. well, I suppose well, back then they probably didn't yeah. have that. But they should have been like, right, you can go out, but you can only go to say your house, and you can spend time. Mm-hmm. You're not allowed to roam around. 
to stay in hotels and motels or whatever, you know, that shouldn't have been allowed. You shouldn't be allowed to do that. You should have been like, right, you're, you've got, like, boundaries. You mm. can go to certain places. But maybe she did. Because she went to the motel with John and mm. maybe she, that's the place she was allowed to go, but then mm. she escaped. Yeah. I don't know, but that's one hell of a woman, isn't it? Yeah, she's mental. Uh, like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, to... She was just obviously... She was just poisoning anyone and everyone around her, so I'm not... I so mean, she... God that... I say thank God because she still committed terrible crimes and somebody did die and stuff like that. But thank God that not everybody ended up dead from it. Yeah, yeah, I get what you mean. Um, but I'm just thinking as well, like, why would you let somebody out who has who doesn't care who she hurts? Mm-hmm. She will poison anybody and everybody yeah. from her husband, from her daughter to little kids, or a her police neighbors. officer. Yeah, her, yeah, exactly. So. To me, that's a that's a massive risk yeah, to let somebody yeah. out like I that. Don't, I don't agree with her being allowed no. out for that. I mean, she, you know, if that if that kind of thing, you know, happens, it should be like many many years into your sentence. Yeah. But then, to me, somebody that gets life and twenty years, and if it's well, if the life means life, then they shouldn't be getting any time. No, but it really annoys me when they all, when they get oh a good behaviour. She was a model prisoner. That's because she's not got poison in her hands. She's got no well exactly. She's got no option to be bad really. Exactly. So guaranteed, if she'd got her hands on on arsenic, she would have been poisoning everybody in that body prison. Well, exactly. <laughs> so you know, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, these model prisoners, yes, because they're in prison and they have restrictions and you yeah, know, they're watched twenty four seven. Yes, that is quite an easy way to become a model prisoner. Exactly. I mean, I know some prisoners do misbehave while they're in prison. Yeah, of course. Of I mean, you do get, like, sort of more, maybe more violent yeah, ones yeah, and yeah, things yeah. like that. But it's like, oh, this guy was a model prisoner. This paedophile was a model prisoner. And it's like, yeah, because there's no children in there. Mm-hmm. That's why. Yeah, that, that's, that's what his crime was. Yeah, so exactly. That's not there for him now, so he can... He's going to behave himself yeah, exactly. because he wants to get out as soon as he can. Yeah, because he probably wants to do it again. So, to give... Privileges like that. I mean, I understand maybe some privileges inside Aye. the prison. Yeah, of course, yeah. Well, you can have you can have an extra hour of TV. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or an extra hour in the the gym, fitness, bit yeah. or whatever, whatever you do. I don't know. Or, or you can get one of the better jobs that they. That yeah, do. exactly. Stuff like that. Aye. That's what they should like, be. I can understand yeah. that, but no, that that that's crazy that she was like. Yeah, it really is. So especially when she was in a maximum security <coughs> prison. Mm-hmm. I don't think you got let out um, in maximum prison, so maximum either, security, but, but then different. different. Uh, yeah, as knows. we always say, different times. Yeah. So there's another case for you. So thank you very much for listening, everybody, and we'll see you next time. See you later. If you would like to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or threads, we are crime underscore divers underscore pod. We are on Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube, and it's Crime Divers Podcast. Our email is crime underscore divers underscore pod at outlook.com. Our website is crimedivers.co.uk. If you would like to join our Patreon, it's patreon.com slash crime divers. And if you would like to buy us a coffee, it's buymeacoffee.com slash crime divers. And if you haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, review.